Hello, welcome to another edition of the Sports Pro Podcast. I am once again your host, Tom Bassam. This week I'm lucky enough to be joined by a couple of my editorial colleagues once again. Hello, Sam Carp. How are you? Hi Tom, I'm good, thanks. How was your holiday? Where have you been? I've been in France. Um, I was supposed to um, I was supposed to watch a stage of the Tour de France uh, on a mountain, but my train was delayed and unfortunately it meant that I had to walk a very, very long way and not see any cycling. I did actually see the very last group come through the second to last village on the route, but I didn't actually watch anything significant, which was a bit disappointing. You've been back in the office all morning and I haven't asked you about that yet, so that's a brand new revelation for everyone in this room. My second ever live Tour de France experience really did not live up to... Uh, live up to what I was hoping for but it means I can just go again next year with hope and nude Josh Sim how are you good thanks yeah it's been a really fun European championships we're going to discuss although it did not come home unfortunately for you guys I say this as a non-Brit in the in the room and I'll be hiding away after this (laughs) you didn't even watch the final live did you no I've caught up on the second half yet as of yesterday it was a good it was a good second half you were you 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 told me it was going to be more exciting than the first one it was yeah, it wasn't too hard, though, was it? I don't think. I was watching it in France with a bunch of my friends. We streamed it on M6+, Plus, which I think is like ITVX, um, but turned the volume off and managed to sync the audio with the BBC Radio 5 live commentary. Uh, okay. So it took a little bit of fiddling around with pause buttons and such like, but um, proves that you can still go pretty caveman when it comes to this kind of stuff. So you didn't fancy venturing out into in public and watching it with the, with the French locals? It was a fair distance from where we were staying and I can't imagine a situation which that would have benefited us particularly. Like <laughs> either we would have either we would have won and been too rowdy or we would have lost and been too depressed and then be surrounded by a French people. Also, we were very close to the Spanish border. There were lots of fireworks going off. Um because we were in Catalonia. There would actually probably been quite a lot of happy Spaniards around to do, which might not have lifted my mood any better than it currently was. But yeah, let's chat about my holiday. We can save that for another podcast if you want, Tom's Tours or whatever. Let's talk about the Euros. That is the reason, after all, that we are here. Let's start with you, Sam. Now, look, I, when I was putting together the running order for this show, I was sort of hoping that we'd win it, and therefore the answer to this would be, it'd be quite easy. But was, was this a good tournament, quote unquote, good? Well, I think Spanish people probably still say it was good. You can't change your opinion just based on the result of the final. Um, but I think, uh, I guess, I think from a sort of footballing or sporting perspective, I think it started really strongly, some really entertaining games. And then I kind of think you saw the the frailties of the, of the format come into play a little bit. Um, I think you also saw the... Um, the load that players have to cope with nowadays come into play a bit as well. Um, so just in terms of the format, I think you saw a lot of teams playing the group stages quite tactically, which led to sort of some of those third fixtures being quite dull. Teams playing for draws in the hope that they were going to slot into that third, into one of those best third place spots, which is kind of where it starts to blur the lines a little bit when you do have some teams who can qualify in third and not just the top two going through, which is kind of an issue since UEFA expanded the tournament. But on the sort of positive side of the changes that UEFA made, I think some of the most entertaining sides there were the ones that got to the tournament as a result of UEFA expanding the Euros. So Georgia, Albania, Romania in some cases as well, I think, you know, were often involved in some of the most some of the best games to watch um, throughout the tournament and kind of were playing with a bit of a, you know, no fear, nothing to lose kind of mentality, which some of the bigger teams weren't. So, yeah, I think it kind of, it sort of started really strong, lost its way a little bit. I actually think the semi-finals and the final were, were decent enough. And then if you're just talking sort of purely operationally, I think the event went quite well. I know there were a few political incidents, I think mainly involving the Balkan nations. But the issues we spoke about on this podcast before the tournament started, some of the issues that people in Germany were perhaps anxious about didn't seem to affect the host nation who put on quite a united front while they were in the tournament. And yeah, some of the issues with the with the trains and transport, which I think mod the group stages, complaints about that seemed to die down as the tournament went on and probably there were less fans to, to deal with and put strain on those systems. So yeah, I'd say generally speaking, I think Germany sort of delivered what they promised to. Yeah, um, I would agree with that too. I, I think there was a, a lot of goodwill towards the fans. There didn't seem to be too much trouble. Yeah, you mentioned those sort of issues with the Balkan states. There was also some issues around 
Turkey and uh, and their relationships with Germany too, but nothing nothing major. I don't think there was no sort of terrible scenes that we had in like France, for example, of like mass brawls out in public squares and stuff like that. So from that perspective, I think it did go off pretty well. Josh, looking at it from that sort of organisational, maybe even the delivery standpoint, actually. So how do you feel like the broadcast came across? How do you feel like some of the the sponsors, do you think they'll come out of it feeling like, yeah, we got a pretty good deal out of this? I think so, given that we'll talk about like the tournament's appeal beyond just Europe, but it does have a worldwide appeal. And you guys discussed it in the pre-tournament pod when with the number of uh, Chinese-based companies that came on as sponsors and, you know, the fact that they saw it as a viable opportunity demonstrates the tournament's platform as a whole. So I think I think sponsors would have got a lot from it. Broadcasters as well. Nick and Chris discussed it on the stream time episode. They bring, like, viewership unlike most other programs. Um, so I think, yeah, as a whole, I think U- UEFA and their, and their partners would have been pleased with the amount of um, engagement they've got and the amount of um, people that they would have reached because of just how big the tournament is and how big its appeal goes beyond the continent. The one interesting thing on the media side for me was, aside from the lack of innovation, which is something that Steve McCaskill has covered quite a lot in his own writing, was you had the broadcasters competing with their talent and the podcast space in between games, taking a very UK specific look at this, but you had the overlap guys on ITV I think they were pretty much using the ITV studio. Um, I'm sure that wasn't an agreed partnership. I'm sure they just turned up with some microphones and stuff like that. And then obviously you had the the rest of football team on the BBC, taking a similar vibe to it and then almost creating news within those cycles as well. What did you make of that, Sam? It became a weird battleground, didn't it? In a strange way for two competing podcasts. One pretty much fronted by Gary Lineker, the other fronted by... Gary Neville and actually yeah I thought it was interesting that a lot of those podcasts were recorded in in the official studios which suggests that you know the BBC and ITV were actually quite happy to get to sort of you know use those as a vehicle for a little bit more attention one thing that I did sort of find is that you it almost felt as if in some situations the talent almost forgot which one they were recording if they were recording a live broadcast (laughs) or um or if they were actually recording a podcast because some of the takes were piping hot during the live broadcast and you almost saw like Gary Lineker let the handbrake off a little bit we always kind of associate him with being quite a, a neutral commentator usually just kind of as the presenter teeing up the pundits to offer their opinion but in this tournament he really kind of went in on England and their performances and it kind of makes you think a little bit his his contract with the BBC is expiring next summer so you wonder if he threw caution to, to the wind a little bit and, and realised he had a podcast to promote and was had one eye on, a, on life after broadcasting. It spoke a little bit as well I suppose to uh, the change of the way these events are covered you know if you're sitting in a broadcast studio now it's not just about giving really sound measured analysis about the game it's also kind of about creating that viral moment that's going to get the coverage notice more on social media which i think like cbs in the us with their champions league coverage have um have done really well with jamie carragher mika richards and um thierry Henry. um you got a sense at times that some of the pundits were trying to create that moment as well I feel like Rio Ferdinand is very aware of that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you had a really weird blurring of the lines and kind of blending of these two very different media formats, I thought, throughout the tournament. Yeah, uh, that was, yeah, that, that for me stood out quite quite a lot. And that that and the, the sort of, the end of Clive Tildesley, which was very sad. Um, but that's more of a personal, that's, I feel like that might be more of a personal thing. Generally, I feel like this is a really solid tournament, like a good one to come back after, maybe a bit, a bit controversial. I mean, it's going to be, it's, it wasn't quite the the 2006 Summer of Love World Cup, but it was still a, a pretty good pretty good return to form for the Euros after France 2016, which was obviously marred by violence, and um, the last Euros, which was like dotted all over the place and didn't really make much sense, and obviously had major impacts because of COVID. Josh, I know you're writing our sort of data piece on this currently. What what do we learn from this tournament from a data perspective, or is, is there anything that you'd like to pick out from um, from your feature, which I think should be available on the dot com at some point this week. Sam talked a little bit about it. You go back to the 2020 World Cup and Germany's national team. Um, I think their final group game, it, it, it well in their group because of their group stage performance as a whole, they didn't pick up a lot of viewership. This tournament is obviously different, and the, and the opening game it, it started off with 22 and a half million viewers on ZDF for the first game against Scotland. Obviously, big win. 
it gets sort of the ball rolling. And from then on, their viewership never dipped under 23 million viewers, which for all their subsequent games, which I guess speaks to the power of the of hosting a tournament and what that can do and how that can sort of get a population excited and reinstall sort of confidence behind a team. That was quite interesting to see how those games became sort of massive draws and, and you know, and that doesn't obviously th- those being figures don't account for the number of people who watch the games in bars and, and pubs and so on. So that was probably the big one. I think all of Germany's games were on free to air TV as well, but Magenta TV owned by Deutsche Telekom had all the games um, as a, a pay TV provider, sort of a bit like going back to the 20, uh, the Women's World Cup, Opta Sport had it for Australia. So a similar setup in France too, where... Um, yeah. TF1 and M6 had uh, had all the France games and the major uh, finals and um, yeah, the major sort of knockout games, but all of the games were available uh, via BN. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a slightly new model for this tournament. What were the findings with Magenta TV? They said they had reached over 70 million fans overall. Um, and they said that was almost double um, the reach they had for the last World Cup, the 2022 World Cup. Um, and this, they obviously, they showed every game and some games they showed exclusively. So sometimes there were some games people had to specifically pay for Magenta TV to watch their team. One being Austria versus Turkey. And given there's a lot of obviously, uh, Turkish people in Germany and, and the close links to Austria as well, it became a massive draw. They on average reached about four and a half million, um, viewers, which they said was nearly double their previous record, uh, for the platform for any broadcast, uh, so yeah, I thought that was really interesting um, given, you know, Germany has always been, I guess, their TV market, a lot of a lot of their stuff's on free-to-air TV, isn't it? There's not it's, many... It's not a massive pay TV market. I mean, it's, it's definitely growing with your Bundesliga on the zone and Sky. But yeah, it's not historically been a, a major pay TV market. Yeah. I think uh, UEFA would have been a bit disappointed when they got knocked out as well, just because Germany, one of, if not the biggest TV market in Europe, definitely among them anyway. But um, you always want the host nations to go further because, you know, that always gives a boost of viewership. I don't know if we've got any numbers from the final. We do from the UK and Spain, obviously, the, you know, England, Spain being represented in the final. So England's, because obviously the final shown on the BBC and ITV, their combined peak audience was about 24.2 million for the final, with the average being 22.3 million. As you'd expect, because of the BBC not having any ads during their coverage, whereas ITV is a commercial network does, the BBC had the majority of viewership with a peak of uh, close to 18 million. But what was interesting is that ITV sort of came out and said, our audience share was about 26%, which they said is the highest that they've ever had since sort of showing a major football championship finals. I guess that speaks to, this might be my opinion, but I felt the level of punditry and the, the expertise they had on on their coverage, for me, edged it. It was a bit above the BBC. And I guess, you know, people feeling similar, for them to sort of be willing to accommodate the sort of advertising ITV sort of um, shows to get access to that sort of punditry and expertise suggests that, um, yeah, ITV did a really good job to sort of, I guess, bring in that sort of punditry talent to sort of elevate their coverage and, and, and attract people who were maybe looking for, you know, that level of expertise and were willing to roll with sort of multiple ad breaks during the coverage. Yeah, yeah it speaks to the cult following of uh, Gary Neville and Roy Keane as well, doesn't it? it uh, yeah. And people like Jill Scott and, and Ian Wright. Yeah, I think uh, Ian Wright probably falls in quite a lot, <laughs> I should imagine. That number for the final is, it's quite a bit lower, isn't it, than what it was in 2021? So 2021, I think the UK number was like 30 million plus. I mean, it probably says more about the fact that this was that was the first final we'd been in in well, since 66. Part of it also what Josh was talking about before, he meant sort of alluded to people watching in pubs and bars like I don't know if you've got say like 200 people gathered around a tv screen in a pub or two tv screens in a pub does that register as like two viewers does that register as 200 viewers um don't know if that might have had an impact as well um because I know like 2021 it felt like everyone was watching it in the pub but at the same time we were still kind of under covid restrictions so pubs only let a certain amount of people in um some people were probably still a little bit um averse to watching um the tournament in crowded spaces so 
I feel like maybe this time around the final was probably you'd probably get more people watching in pubs, which might have negatively impacted those those viewing numbers if if they are being registered by kind of like device rather than like by actual number of people watching. There's definitely a case for that as well. There's probably a few different factors, but that, that's definitely one of them. Like the, that group viewing thing was definitely clear here in London. Um, nearly impossible to get a, like any kind of booking anywhere to watch an England game. Yeah, unless you'd really planned it through the whole tournament in advance, uh, as I found out on a couple of occasions. For the final, I think I could see half a plant and half of the pitch, so uh, <laughs> properly wedged into a corner in a pub, and it was not a very good viewing experience, but maybe that was for the best. Yeah, perhaps. Any other data things that you would pull out at all, Josh? I mean, it's probably worth mentioning Spain, given they won the tournament. RTV, the public service broadcaster, netted 13.6 million viewers, which is their biggest audience for any football broadcast since the 2012 Euro final, which they obviously won against Italy. So obviously, yeah, uh, again, it you know, when your team's winning, obviously the whole public sort of t- tunes in and obviously Spain saw that and RTVE saw that. I guess the other thing I mentioned at the start that the tournament's appeal goes beyond Europe. Fox Sports in the US, they drew 6.43 million viewers for their coverage of the final, which they said was the most watched Euros broadcast in the States on record. They also said that this year's tournament as a whole was their most watched European championships in English language in the US with an average of uh, 1.68 million viewers per game. So again, speaks to the Euros appeal, but also is quite interesting given that Copa America was going on, kicked off sort of halfway through in their backyard as well at the same time. So again, if you're a European football executive looking to, you know, do more things and activations in the US, it probably augurs well that they held such appeal on Fox Sports. Sorry to interrupt your podcast. This is just a quick reminder that as a listener to the podcast, you can get a exclusive 10% discount on an annual Sports Pro Plus membership. If you're not yet a Sports Pro Plus member, I implore you to go and sign up. It's our subscription product. It's packed full of extremely important and very useful features. Inclusive, but not limited to our media hub, which features things like market spotlights, media rights trackers, quarterly deal analysis, all of our extensively researched and wonderfully produced commercial guides. Sports Pro Plus readers also get access to our in-depth analysis of the biggest news in the sports industry. And as I said, Sports Pro podcast listeners can get an exclusive 10% discount now. That is if you use the code PODCAST10 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Um, and that is for an annual subscription only. Thank you very much. And uh, let's return to our regularly scheduled listening. Sam, is there anything else that you learned from this tournament? Maybe maybe less data related? So I, I went out there for like four or five days. Didn't get around loads. I was in Berlin um, for a few days. Was in Stuttgart for about 20 hours. Um, so <laughs> not the longest amount of time. But I think kind of what I took away from the whole thing both from being there but also sort of engaging with it from here in the UK is that the areas are so much better with one host uh, I think obviously 2020 was an ambitious project anyway to mark a special anniversary made it all the more harder by COVID um, and the varying restrictions that were in place in the different countries that were hosting games but I think also it just kind of everything just felt a little bit detached basically throughout that it became a little bit hard to follow I think it was definitely challenging for fans whereas what I think you saw in Germany was like a real appetite among those supporters who had gone to engage with each other again lap up the fact that Germany is not a small country but it was pretty you know pretty short distances to travel they could arrive like a day or two before the game they could even stay out there for two or three fixtures so yeah, I think that's kind of the thing that I took away from it. And the fan the fan culture was just really, really good. Yeah, as we sort of said at the start, people were mixing, friend, like being really friendly. There wasn't that kind of needle that you sometimes associate with with these tournaments. And I think also it's kind of it's interesting juxtaposing that with, you know, what FIFA are doing now in terms of they're going down this kind of multi-host model quite a lot. So obviously the next World Cup being in the US, Mexico and Canada, the one after that being split between, I don't know, is it five countries maybe starting in South America and then ending up in Europe? It's just, yeah, everything's going to feel very detached in those tournaments. And I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. Yeah, it found that having everything quite compact again 
um, in Germany had a really positive impact on the tournament. I guess we'll have a sort of similar experience next time, given that the Euro is going to be in the UK and the Republic of Ireland um, before UEFA unlearns that lesson and splits it between Italy and Turkey in 2032. Um, so, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem to be a consensus launched on this. It does mean to me that like, it likes splitting the hosting rights between a few places, probably helps with qualification, probably helps with, yeah, logistics and other bits and pieces to not put all of the burden onto one country. But there are certainly countries where they, I think it's a little bit easier to do that. And Germany is probably the prime example along with France and the UK for being able to do it. Okay. All right. Let's, let's move on. Josh, was there anyone for you who changed their narrative during this tournament? So went into it, you felt, well, this is how I, this is, this is how I feel about this. This is how I feel about this individual. This is how I feel about this thing. And you came away from it feeling actually they've, they've kind of changed my mind over the course of this. It feels like a cop out answer, but, um, the German national team, I realized it's straying in one's performance, but they hadn't performed well in recent international tournaments. And then um, there was a bit of doom and gloom about their performances. There was that poll that came out in the German newspaper talking about sort of, is the German national team white enough, essentially? It just felt like there was a very sort of, I don't know, div divisive sort of gloom hovering over them. And I think what the tournament showed was that it put those sort of narratives to rest, I think. And they played well. They had a lot of people behind them they are not fully white they're represented by a uh, different ethnicities i feel like they as a team sort of did really well to sort of transform their reputation in front of the nation i think people are now really excited to see what that team goes on to do and people are going to be excited to see especially with the younger players like uh, musiala and, and florian Vert. so yeah i i might be yeah it feels like a cop-out answer but it i feel like they did a lot and also as a, as a host country again we talked about what good job they've done i feel like they will be remembered quite fondly as tournament hosts yeah, it definitely seemed like the German people fell back in love with uh, with the German football team again. Yeah, for me, the overriding image is of that saxophone player playing uh, playing anthems out in the fan zone in his in his retro shirt. Um, Sam, for you, was there any narrative changes? I'm going to sound like a cheerleader for this brand because I think I've spoken about them a few times on the podcast recently, but I think it's quite hard to look past Adidas for me, um, mainly because, yeah, they did have a pretty just so many negative headlines about that brand in the first sort of over the last year basically um in terms of yeah tra like tracing all the way back to the end of the Kanye West partnership and the impact that's had on their business and then obviously started the year by losing that German national team kit contract to Nike uh so this was a really big tournament for them in their home market and so they came into it under a lot of pressure that started it with a really creative launch of Germany Euro 2024 kit. I think the away kit, which was actually quite controversial, I think, because it was pink, um, <laughs> had ended up being the best selling that they'd had. So yeah, started it really strongly. And I think some of the campaigns that they did kind of stood the test of time. So the Hey Jude campaign was well received initially, but obviously putting that much on one individual is always a risk in case player either doesn't perform or goes out really early in the tournament that didn't happen there'll be people who think he didn't play as well as he could have done but he also provided that moment with the bicycle kick in the last minute and you know they've been able to turn that into an ad I think with his boot and shot and the Adidas logo so some nice kind of reactive stuff there and then also they landed a few blows overnight during the tournament you know Lamine Yamal is vindicating my shout as the breakout star of the tournament um, he is he's sponsored by Adidas um, and he had that moment in the semi-final you know an Adidas sponsored athlete um scoring that goal against nike sponsored mbappe in nike sponsored france before adidas sponsored spain go and speak Nike sponsored england in the final so yeah i think there were lots of positives for adidas throughout the euros and yeah it's hard to think of another brand really that flipped the narrative quite so much during that month yeah and it, it certainly seems like it's paid out too they announced their uh, uh their preliminary q2 results and um the big, the big thing out of that is that they've increased their full year projections for revenue, which having had a few down years of, as a result of the Kanye West Yeezy stuff, there's definitely been a, definitely been a positive. So yeah, I, I think Adidas definitely enjoyed a, a very strong tournament. I guess for me, it's sort of similar to Josh's one, but for me, Spain had a very good tournament. Uh, like that kind of goes without saying, but 
after they won the last World Cup, a lot of focus was placed on the leadership there. I'm not convinced entirely that all of those problems have gone away. But what you will say is that whatever they do um, as an organisation, the Spanish FA, in terms of producing quality coaches, that's a vindication of the, of, of the organisation that they do there because Luis de la Fuente is a, is a product of the RFEF Spanish coaching system. He was previously coached the youth teams. He's not coached really outside of that body. And again, he produced a, a team which played the most coherent football throughout the whole tournament. And while that's not strictly business focused, part of what a soccer body is there to do is to produce national talent. And he certainly managed to do that. And he, he is himself a product of that system. So yeah, for me, that was, got, you've got to give some credit to the Spanish FA where it's due. I'll do that reluctantly, but um, yeah. I don't know if you even need to give credit to the Spanish FA. I think you need like, maybe it's credit to like the strength of the Spanish talent pathway and its ability to still deliver despite the best efforts at governance level to undermine it. <laughs> um, Cause you've had like Rubiales in the past year um, claiming that he was, uh, I think I've got it written down here, the comment that he made, he said he was a victim of false feminism after forcing his case on Jenny Hermoso after they won the Women's World Cup. And then even today, today we're recording on Wednesday submerged that Pedro Roca who took over from Rubial as an interim basis has been suspended for two years for what's been described as a very serious infringement of his authority I think um, like, maybe I'll track this as but a, I think, like, as I, think you're, I think you're right to point out like the pathway and like the infrastructure that's in place um and yeah the fact of the matter is that they're now uh champions of Europe and champions of Europe on the men's side, champions of the world on the women's side. And that's kind of in spite of what's been going on with the people leading that organisation. So yeah, just kind of, I guess it speaks to the strength of like, I guess the predecessors and what's been put in place by the organisation over time. Well, uh, I'll I'll semi-retract it then. Um, Okay, (laughs) Josh, what was your favourite moment? Uh, I mean, you've mentioned the German saxophonist, so I won't won't go there, but I'll say the Albanians snapping spaghetti in front of the Italian fans was a very strong (laughs) shout early on. Laid the groundwork for a lot of food related posters such as fondue being better than I can't remember what the pasta pizza or something like that um there were a lot of very witty ones the other one for me was the uh was the England fan who woke up in uh, Schalke stadium the day after England's game against Serbia with sort of no inkling of time space just did not know where or how he'd got there obviously you know, there were there were transport issues in terms of England fans getting home from that game. Well, he managed to avoid the bulk of them, didn't he? By, uh, by having a yeah. little kip in the stadium. Yeah, I guess he decided to go for the morning uh, rush hour, <laughs> sort of moan and said. But um, yeah, those two sort of come to mind, I think. Sam, for you? Oh, the food wars was my main one. But I guess um, it'd probably be from one when I was just out at the tournament, like going to the Scotland-Hungary game was a dreadful game of football, championship level for sure. Um, but just the sense of occasion was like incredible getting the tram into the grounds I was in with the Scotland fans and it was going alongside all the Hungary fans who were like yeah just waving enjoying themselves and then you got in the stadium and like the Scottish national anthem was somebody studied in Scotland for a few years um the Scottish national anthem was like something really yeah like really pretty striking to see live and then I think what was even better was that as soon as it stopped, the Hungary fans kind of woke up and the stadium started shaking with the atmosphere they were creating. And I think it's probably, yeah, probably the best live atmosphere that I've that I've witnessed, to be honest, at a football match. So yeah, credit to those two sets of supporters. I know neither of you got out of the group, but um, at least you, at least you sang loud. <laughs> <laughs> My personal one, and this is maybe unsurprising, was how yeah was the was that Bellingham last minute equaliser. I don't think I've ever gone. My range of emotions has never gone from so depressed and so downbeat to so elated in such a short space of time. Um, and then just the quality of the goal in general was, um, it was crazy. Uh, it's one of those moments I think people will talk about with England for a very, very long time and will be on montages for years to come. To Sam's point, it was really quick from Adidas to sort of get that poster up of the mid-air boot and sort of, again, demonstrate what a strong tournament they had in terms of being responsive to these moments and, and capturing them and, and, and then using them as a marketing tool as well. Yeah, I was uh, watching Avril Lavigne at Glasgow when that goal went in, <laughs> so I uh, had no idea. <laughs> Two the very different emotions we were experiencing <laughs> at that point in time. <laughs> Too true. Right. The final, the final thing we should probably do is have a look back, Sam, and uh, Josh, you weren't here for these, but uh, it's to have a look back at some of our predictions for the tournament. I think you said Lamine Yamal would have, was going to be the breakout player of the tournament. 
Yeah, but that didn't feel like hard. That didn't feel like a difficult prediction to make. Although Steve went for Rasmus Hoyland. Yeah, it was a very rogue shout. Awful shout. Um, <laughs> and I went for Florian Verts, which again, like, it, it, it was fine. Didn't do a lot. Got a big goal against Spain, which proved not to be a big goal in the end. Yeah. Well, I think he had an all right tournament, but yeah, I think it's safe to say you both owe me points. Yeah, um, <laughs> I came quite close to getting the winner, the closest out of anyone, because no one predicted Spain and I predicted England. Right. Unfortunately, there was no influencer related incident, which I also predicted. The thing is, though, I feel there wasn't, but we put that Salt on Bay, uh, Salt Bay, didn't we? Yeah. And he was mysteriously absent. So maybe maybe UEFA really strengthened strengthen their Salt Bay security restrictions <laughs> uh, at the tournament. But another another influencer who was just constantly there was i show speed oh, and God. i have no idea what this guy does like jen I, he, this is probably me showing my age maybe he's, but. A, he's a streamer on youtube he, he does gaming but mostly he just tries to create viral moments he, he barks for a living yeah yeah there was yeah there was a video i saw of fans chasing after him barking if we have our favorite moment at tournament that might be my least favorite <laughs> yeah unfortunately he didn't it wasn't quite but like maybe it's because ronaldo is so bad and that big part of his whole thing is that ronaldo is his god um but yeah, there wasn't there wasn't that salt bay. It wasn't big enough to be a salt bay in the final moment, which mm. is a real shame for me. I think because yeah, otherwise I'm, I think I'm in big pint deficit. Yeah, but I think um, yeah, I went for I went for Germany to win the tournament. Wrong. Uh, I my controversy. I suggest it would be something to do with VAR and the Adidas ball. If anything went the other way on that. Well, it could still happen. I think uh, everyone's pretty sure that Spain's winning goal was offside. So maybe something's going to come out in a couple of days about uh, a delay in the technology, proving that his toe actually was ahead of John Stones' knee. So I'm still holding out on that one, holding out on points for that. But yeah, I don't think I can claim that one. That will kind of seemed to work pretty well apart from when it was left back in the hands of the humans I think and all the English humans yeah, the Netherlands like goal it. got disallowed against France I think that was pretty harsh well there was that brief moment where um Belgium's goal was disallowed because of uh I mean, cricket fans will know Snicko. Yeah. So that made its introduction into the football world in a way, in a way that I don't think anyone predicted beforehand yeah, I can't remember what Steve's controversy was. I did message him before this to ask. He said something political related. So I think... Well, uh, yeah, there was. you could maybe claim that. that. Yeah. Perhaps that's the closest we got. Yeah. Um, was he not more specific than, than that? Yeah. He also put brackets, I think. It says the fact that we make these predictions and then really don't live by them at all or even attempt to track them. More, more like try and forget them, I think. Not many successes and uh, maybe it's best we also don't revisit our most marketable 11 because uh, <laughs> I think a few of those guys let us down as well. <laughs> yeah, let's let's not talk about that anymore. Okay, all right, gents. Um, I think that's probably a good place to leave it. Um, Josh, Sam, thank you very much. Cheers, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, listener. We will be back next week with an Olympics preview in which you'll hear from Sam again. Wow, you guys are lucky right now. A lot of Sam Carp on the pod. But yeah, there was going to be plenty of Olympics covers actually across the Sports Pro site. Our new commercial guide is up now. You can check that out. But over the next week or so, there's going to be plenty of Paris 2024 coverage for you to get stuck into. Speak to you then. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you.